Okay, welcome back to members of 121 Community Church in Grapevine, Texas, and our ongoing study in a phenomenology of Christian life by Felix Mercata, published by Indiana University Press in 2013. We're going to take a look at chapter 3, pages 90 to 120, entitled Glory and Being. And it's a good look at uh, a phenomenology of Christology. So it's a pretty strong chapter by Mercata, but uh, it will center in on the uh, crucifixion. Let's begin with Locke 1 take a look at being in the world but not of the world. Mercata tells us that the play of light and dark is an appearing that reveals instances of the surplus of promise that are perceived by desire. In the depth of the world, promise shines forth within the eschatological horizon. But being is revealed as that which transcends generalization because it becomes signification. The Christ narrative is a thing of singularity. It is a singularity of self-revelation. And it opens the light and the darkness of things. And it is where the divine incarnates the earthly. So the Christ event, <clears throat> most importantly here, the statement by Mercata is that he calls these instances of transcendence, he calls them singularities, singularities of the self-revelation of God. And that singularity is in note two, it's in but not of the world. Doxa, glory, is that which appears in the world that is not of the world. So that's his definition of doxa, the Greek doxa. To be of something is to be about something. Christ says that his disciples do not belong to the world. So singular being means to be not of the world, to be a called out one. He says that's equal to Heidegger's being in the world. When Heidegger used the term being in the world, he meant it in this way of being in the world but not of the world. That's the way that he interprets Heidegger. So if we look at Heidegger's being in the world in note three, it provides the basis for the intellect and it provides the basis for positing where we posit inner worldly being. That makes the relation of entities possible as a being toward another. There's an inward essence that constitutes the interrelatedness of things in the world. So note four, the relation toward entities, we are toward that which can reveal itself. Therefore, being in world is a movement toward the real and a concern for the real. It unfolds in the following moments. An entity first manifests itself as a possibility, then the self takes up a, an, a concern, an eschatological concern, and then the movement of desire takes place. So we're looking at a movement from possibility to desire in note five. Entities only revealed are only revealed through the world. For the self who is a being in the world. The inner world entity does not remain abstract. It is Pragmata, practical as well. Its place in practical wisdom is discovered by not taking a thing in its isolation. It is always integrated into an ongoing sign model construction. So let's take a look at note six. And we see that the IDAS forms are not taken in isolation because they belong to the totality of the Pragmata, it has a place within the larger hierarchy of being, an inner connection to something else, 
this total order is discovered and refined through our movement of positing and praxis. And in this way, being is dis disclosed, disclosed. So note seven, we take a look at this uh, disclosure of being. We seek to form, and here's your key point, we are to form an ontological definition of entities. Every IDAS form has a place within the lar larger hierarchy of being. We look at each thing's readiness to integrate itself into the hierarchy of being. The sensate realm manifests the real world. Rupture takes place within the world context, revealing an openness where an IDOS form needs practical insertion. We spiritually perceive the open possibilities within reality. So it's, it is rupture and the open opening of possibility. In note 8, entities function as signs. They transcend generalization. They point beyond themselves, leading to the recognition of the totality of relevance or the hierarchy of being. This hierarchy depends upon the self's movement of being in the world, allowing the real world to appear. Remember, being in the world but not of the world. That is the definition of Heidegger's being in the world. So we take a look at this real world and appearing in note 9. Inner realities appear as present and relational, and they are put in place through the shining forth of horizon, the horizon for real world. So we participate in the shining forth of real world in Note 10. Real world is the opening that allows things to be. It's a rupture of sensate world, which draws the self into itself, causing the self's attachment of desire and movement of desire. Remember, we begin with that passive receptivity of self-revelation. So it actually causes us to begin the movement of that attachment of desire. That moves us uh, from the theoretical block one into the concrete block and block two. Now in block two, we look at the singularity of self-revelation and its messianic moment. We look at the cross now in block two. Messianic is non-temporal in the world, it is the experience of the having come of the Messiah, the having already come of the Messiah, as having already transformed the past and the present and the future, transforming the place where human beings live. The cross punctures, punctures the field of phenomena. It intersects, intersects and punctures the field of phenomena. And note two, the messianic appears as the Clasis call of Christ, calling things to existence as ecstatic, which means to see things eschatologically, as things in their singularity or their unique origin, and that means we see reality in a state of flux, in a state of liberation where worldly age has ended and apocalyptic age is emerging. So it's all about note three, apocalyptic age. Christ recapitulates humanity and all of creation together. And that word is uh, anakaphali kai. It means to recapitulate where Christ is the guiding principle of all creation. We reread the past in light of the Christ event. Signs need to be reconfigured. And we know Paul reconfigured all of his rabbinic signs. He rewrote signs after his encounter with Christ. But signs need to be reconfigured. So we look at a work of reconfiguring the signs. Christ is the new Adam. The divine and the human intersect in Christ as the eruption of the messianic. Messianic moments are singularities, they are non-temporal, they are non-spatial in a sensate, sensate way, and they are received passively when they come into being. We are affected by self-revelatory singularities. So it's all about this coming into being of the Messianic in Note 5. 
The secular world is a war of opposites, a struggle for possession. Within this concept, context, there is being in the world as a movement of being in the world. It's being as existence, which means not being of the world, even though we are in the world. And it's a movement within the certitude of peace. Within the certitude of peace. That's important. And peace is irene in the Greek, and it means the healing of fragmentation. It means the healing of fragmentation. So note six, peace is thought of ontologically, equating it with harmony and healing of fragmentation, overcoming the world of opposites. Peace is fulfillment of being. It's a gift of Yahweh. It's peace as gift. So let's take a look at that notion of peace as gift. The Messiah is the Prince of Peace who comes in doxa glory. In other words, he comes in the world, but not he's not of the world. Dokeo, or do, dokaimoi, means as something appears to the self. The doxa glory comes to appearance. Doxa opens up the future. Our positing and our practice are to correspond to this appearance of the doxa glory in Christ. Our movement of desire is to correspond to the doxa glory in the self-revelatory messianic moment of Christ. So we are involved in a concrete positing and praxis in the face of doxa. Note 8. Doxa glory is that which needs to be learned. The self is indwelt with the force and the weight of this doxa manifestation, enabling the self to stand out by making God apparent. God's appearance is always veiled in cloud. It's always veiled behind the sensate. But through spiritual perception, spiritual seeing, and spiritual hearing, we discern the doxa glory of the self-revelatory messianic moment in Christ. So let's move on to note 9. Appearance of doxa is always veiled. Philosophy subordinates doxa to episteme. For Christianity, it is manifestation of God's agape self-giving. Episteme is confined to the world. Agape transforms the world. Our positive praise, our positive prayer disrupts the world and the world of episteme. Agape self-giving transcends episteme knowledge. So we looked at our theoretical block in block one and the shining forth of the real within the midst of the sensate. And then we looked at the concrete side in block two where we do participate in the healing of fragmentation, in the harmony, the ontological harmony of all concrete entities in actuality. And now we move on to glory and the cross in block three. This entire lesson is a Christology looked at through phenomenology. So Mercado tells us that the cross of Jesus was a monumental event, very difficult to comprehend because the notion of the death of God is controversial. It manifests God as powerless. It gives expression to human desire. Note two, the cross exemplifies extreme passivity. Glory is the appearance of suffering as love without reward. An event that throws all human relation in throws all human relation out of play. But it is an event of glory also. The cross is an expression of glory. In note three, it presents being as giving, being as self-giving. The cross reveals light as suffering self-giving. In the light of abandonment, this death presents a mode of being in the world by being not of the world. And the key point then in the entire lesson is three, block three, note four, the cross is not of the world. It bears witness to the insufficiency of the world. 
an end of existence and an end of one point of view concerning the world, an event that is irreducible to world. It creates a change in understanding. Death is placed at the center of the holy. God takes up death within himself to overcome it. So cross, cross at the center of the holy. Note 5. Christ is the principle of life. The self passes through death when entering into the ecclesia of the called out ones. Death, death is the leaving of the previous life. Now the self lives as reborn after death. Accepting this death out of love, this death of the prior self out of love. And that creates spiritual perception to perceive the radiance of things in note 6. Things manifest their expression of origin, their own radiance. They radiate doxa. Doxa is things as they are heavenly, revealing the promise of spiritual destiny. In other words, it's eschatological revealing, the unveiling of eschatological horizon for everything. Everything participates in the doxa radiance of the eschatological destiny. So it's all about a promise of spiritual destiny in note 7. Numa spirit equals singularity of being, a singularity of being not of the world, where things present their own radiance and it's not of the world, it's to be seen as light. We see the idos form as doxa of being. There's your key statement. There's your key axiom. Idos form equals doxa of being. Idos form equals doxa of being. Keep that in mind. That's a key point, a key axiom. It appears to the heart of the self as faith, hope, and love. So our movement of desire is a movement of faith, hope, and love responding to the idas form revealed as the doxa of being. That leads us to positive transcendence over mere knowledge. The creation groans in labor. Our suffering is as nothing compared to the doxa glory disclosed for us where we become the huioi, the children of God, the huioi to Theu, the children of God. The second coming is relevant for all of creation. So it's doxa for all creation in block 3, note 10. Holiness exists in the possibility of transformation into the singularity of being. Things do not simply exist as objects of knowledge. They are expressions of spiritual plenitude of being not of the world. The entire lesson centers on the fact that Jesus Christ revealed the essential nature of what it means to be a huias to Theu, a child of God. What does that mean? It means to participate in the Irene healing of fragmentation to bring forth the kingdom of God as a kingdom of peace, a kingdom of Irene peace. We do that through our positing. We do that through our praxis. We do that by recognizing that idas form is the doxa of being. It is the radiance of being, a radiance that we perceive through the movement of desire. Tremendous and very important lesson, really, I think. This chapter 3 is really a core lesson, okay? It's a core lesson. Keep in mind that the idas form is the doxa of being. That's really the axiom you should take away from this lesson. This chapter 3 is that idas form equals doxa of being. That's going to wrap up chapter 3, pages 90 to 120. We'll pick up next time in chapter 4.